welcome. Welcome to CSIS. Thanks, everyone, for braving the cold weather and coming on out. And welcome to our online viewers. I'm Mackenzie Eaglin, a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in the humble shadow of my friends and colleagues here at CSIS uh, to moderate today's discussion on what we can expect in the president's budget request for defense for 2020. Cannot, can you believe it's that year already? Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce our panel, and then we're going to kick it off with opening remarks. We're going to start with Kat and uh, narrow the cone here down from the strategic to the, the details, uh, the, what we can expect from Todd. So briefly, I know they need no introduction, uh, but just for the very few that may be tuning in for the first time or something to that effect. Um, Kath Hicks is a Senior Vice President in the Henry Kissinger Chair and the Director of the International Security Program here at CSIS. She's had many important and thoughtful jobs at the Pentagon, but she concluded her tenure in the Obama administration as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense. Uh, let's see, next we have Mark Kansian, a former colonel in the military in the Marine Corps. He's a senior advisor here at CSIS in the same program. Uh, he's been here for over three years and comes from uh, the White House Budget Office, where he served seven years uh, as Chief of Force Structure and Investment Division. Andrew Hunter three down from me. He's a senior fellow also in the ISP program, as well as director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here. Uh, also in the Obama administration for more than three years, Andrew served as a senior executive in DOD in the acquisition uh, directorate, uh, and also before that on Capitol Hill as a professional staff member of the uh, House Armed Services Committee. And finally, and not, not the least, of course, is Todd Harrison. He's the director of the Defense Budget Analysis here and director of the Aerospace Security Project. Um, he previously worked at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, where we've all read his uh, outstanding work, and previously before that was a consultant in the private sector on Air Force issues. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. We are, we are in your shadow, so thank you very much for, for joining us today for this session, um, and thanks again to those of you who are here in the room and watching online. Um, I'm going to uh, start with not the obvious issue, which is the second item will be Mark, and that will be the obvious issue, which is how much for defense, but we're going to bait and switch you a little by starting the talk with, let's talk a little bit about not how much, but on what, and for what, and how. And this is a really challenging issue, I think, for this 2020 budget. There's been so much buildup. We had the Mattis memo that said 18 was gonna be about readiness, 19 was gonna be about joint capability and capacity, then we had the NDS come out just before the NDS came out, then Deputy Secretary, now Acting Secretary Shanahan, made his reference to the 2020 budget being the masterpiece, where the, uh, meaning the budget would be, uh, the, f the 2020 budget would be the first time that the strategy was fully thread through the budget. So expectations are presumably high, or should be high, that we will see in this 2020 budget uh, pretty substantial shifts toward, or indicators toward, what it means to be a competition budget or have an innovation agenda. Um, and, you know, I think the big challenge to DOD is that I think even with the funds they have requires breaking some, no pun intended, China um, in terms of the trade-offs that are going to have to be made if you're really going to make room in the budget to invest in some of these new areas. Um, so very briefly, I, we, we all put out pieces that will come out after the event today, and I, I focused on uh, three issues that will help me when I look at the 2020 budget, the justification documents, the posture statements, to think through the degree to which the department really has taken on this shift. And it won't just be about how much they're spending. It'll be the following kind of three areas. The first is, does the budget and all the materials around it really manifest an investment with an operational, a set of operational concepts behind it? And are those the operational concepts that are most animating in terms of these uh, competitions with China in particular, because Shanahan has said his priorities are China, 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 and Russia um, and other uh, powers? So there you would be looking for things like, is there a concept for, of operations that seems to be behind the idea of how we're going to invest in, for instance, counter A2, AD capabilities? Um, for example, in precision strike, uh, things of that sort. And how do they explain the story, which despite it being all unclassified, they need to have a story to tell about how taxpayer dollars are going to be spent to advance 
um, on these operational concepts and how those concepts have an opportunity to take advantage, if you will, in these competitions. I think the second thing I'm looking for, and, and perhaps feeling a little uniquely looking for, so I'll emphasize this point, um, which I don't think gets made enough, is that you want to see in the budget and all the materials and even maybe the legislative proposal package that comes out following the budget, you'll want to see is the department institutionalizing a culture of innovation. We have, of course, things like DIUX, now DIU. We have the Strategic Capabilities Office. We've had joint rapid um, technology offices and acquisition offices like Andrew has run before. Um, the services are doing things in terms of like Army Futures Command. But I think there is this question about at the joint level, at the, at the enterprise-wide level with the demise of GIFCOM, and I'm not suggesting a return to GIFCOM, and the demise of its predecessor, the Office of Force Transformation. What is the institutional approach, the enterprise-wide approach to ensuring that we're experimenting and it's funded? that we are exercising against those experiments, that we are um, marrying concepts uh, to technology and to operators. So something like a joint exper a competitive joint experimentation fund would be something that I would look at and be delighted to see, um, indicating that there's a shift in culture about how the department's gonna do business. And lastly, I think I'll be looking at S&T in particular, R&D in general, but S&T, both the overall spending levels and then where it's going. Are, are there strong indicators that we're looking in all the right places for those advanced technologies, be they in the material sciences, biosciences, um, and or of course information technology and computing, quantum computing, et cetera, sciences, that indicate that the United States takes broadly this challenge set. Last thing is, uh, competing in the future isn't just about DOD, and it's probably more than anything about how we societally start to look at many of these same issues of S&T investment, innovation, and, and uh, linking together information diplomacy economics with military. So the burden won't be entirely on the Defense Department, uh, but there will still be a lot to look for in that 2020 budget. Perfect groundwork. Mark? Well, thank you. Uh, and thinking about the top line, I'm going to be looking at five things. The first thing is when the budget actually comes out. Of course, it's supposed to come out the first week in February. The administration has acknowledged it's going to be late. Uh, I've heard rumors that it may be as much as five weeks late. If that's the case, then it starts to back up the whole process and CRs, continuing resolutions, become uh, more probable in the fall. Uh, and then all of the pathologies, budget pathologies that uh, follow from that. Second thing I'm looking for is the top line. Uh, many of you have been following the wild ride that DOD has had so far, and they haven't even published a budget yet. Uh, originally, they were aiming at a $733 billion um, budget. Now, that's 050, and budget speak, that is, that's DOD's base, that's the OCO, and that's the uh, uh, other piece, mostly uh, nuclear programs in DOE. Uh, then uh, the president was briefed about the deficit, and said, well, no, 700 billion. So DOD built another budget at 700 billion. Then Mattis uh, reclamed, and the president came back and said, okay, 750 billion. Uh, so they built three budgets uh, already. It looks like 750 billion is probably the number. But my understanding is that there's still a discussion going on about whether uh, there'll be money in there for a wall on the southern border. And there's, I think, some discussion about whether it might, that might be $5 billion or $10 billion. Uh, so the amount that DOD really has to work for could be a, a little less than the, the 750. Third issue is about the structure of the budget. Now a $750 billion 050 based on a past experience would imply a base budget of about $650 billion, uh, OCO war funding of about 70, and then 30 for the, the nuclear programs. You could imagine uh, that being structured differently. Uh, they might put some of that money the, above the 733 into the war funding. We've done that before. So you might be able to see war funding of maybe 77 uh, billion and keeping the, um, the base budget where it would have been at, at 733. Uh, and that might indicate that, you know, some distance, you know, maybe uh, OMB trying to signal that this is a one-time bump up. This is not a, a, a permanent increase in DOD's uh, top line. You could even see a structure like the old OGSI from the uh, Obama years, and you know, this is one of these budget trivia questions, but this was an opportunity growth and security initiative. 
that the Obama administration had proposed in the FY15 budget, arguing that if the Congress would accept the offsets that they had put forward, then uh, they could buy uh, all of these additional uh, programs. And that was, and if that were done, that would again signal some distance from this in budget increase above the 733. The fourth issue, and, and really I think uh, a very important one, is management efficiencies. The administration's budget strategy had been to have large budget increases in 17, 18, and 19, but then from 20 on, the top line would be flat in constant dollar terms. And the idea was that the department would find management efficiencies to create the budget headroom needed to fund the kinds of programs that Kath described that were implied by the new defense strategy. And there were people, uh, the president and people around the president, who believed that there was lots of waste in the Department of Defense and that it would be easy to find these savings. The FY19 budget talked about processes to find savings, but didn't actually identify very many savings. And in fact, uh, if they really had found a lot of savings in, for the 20 budget, I think you'd be hearing the screams from the Pentagon from here, <laughs> because to get that kind of money, you would have to cut some you know, very deeply into some programs that uh, would have many advocates. And in fact, you've been hearing from the Army particularly about how they've conducted what they call night court, and that is a process by which they are cutting programs to create this, this headroom for these new, uh, uh, these new initiatives. But the kind of programs they're cutting are warfighting programs. These are lower priority modernization programs, lower priority uh, training. They're not pulling it out of um, uh, overhead and infrastructure. Uh, the worst thing would be if DOD put some sort of wedge into the future budgets for savings to be identified in the future because those almost never uh, are found and it just creates uh, turbulence in the out years and waste. And the final thing is the observation that the president proposes and the Congress disposes. This year will probably be rockier than most, certainly rockier than last year, uh, because you now have a Democratic Congress. You know, the Democrats have been moving uh, to the left and they particularly question certain programs that the administration has proposed. For example, the nuclear modernization programs are certain ones of those. Um, and then in the background, you have the Budget Control Act, which if, if the uh, Congress and the administration can't come to an agreement, you know, will uh, entail some very significant cuts. So with that. Great. Thank you. Andrew, your turn. Well, thanks. I'm going to uh, align myself on Team Kath here <laughs> and go with the argument that from a modernization perspective, where I'm going to focus my remarks, uh, it is much more about the how than the how much. Uh, and uh, I, I say that because I think the last two years have demonstrated that you can significantly increase modernization funding without necessarily doing much to execute the strategy. Um, and when you look at where the last two years of increases in uh, the modernization counts have gone, they've gone overwhelmingly into uh, existing production lines, producing systems that we have been producing for at least two decades, in some cases longer. Uh, and those are fine things. They're very good things. We're not going to regret, I don't think, buying those things, but they are not what you would call strategically aligned if you look at uh, the emphasis and the strategy on emerging technologies like hypersonic systems, artificial intelligence, human machine teaming, directed energy, you don't see a lot of that in these systems that we're currently investing quite a bit of money in. Um, and so uh, I think it's interesting to dwell just briefly on, on why is that? Why did that happen? And it happened, I think, largely because just as we behaved in a very unstrategic manner when we cut in 2013 because we had a sudden reduction in budget authority that had not been planned for and we had to find it wherever we could and the strategy be darned uh, in that process, when money suddenly ramped up very rapidly in FY18 and FY19, late in the game, hadn't been really sought um, in 2018 by the administration, it was done by Congress, and then in 19, the administration got on board but hadn't really planned for the size of increase that ultimately arrived. Uh, the only way to spend that money and not see it just eventually expire is to put it into existing production lines that are, have contracts in place have items that have already been designed and developed and are ready to produce, where you can actually spend that kind of money in a rapid time frame. Uh, so we've gone through a period now of uh, being almost comically misaligned between what we're buying and what the strategy suggests we ought to be doing to prepare for peer competition. Uh, I think 2020 is the year that really starts to turn around, and that's, that's what I'll be looking for. Um, but because of the nature of the fact that this is very budget-driven, 
and the fact that we have dramatically changed the way that acquisition is organized in the Department of Defense, it's going to be very much driven by the services. And so I think you're going to see very different behavior mm -hmm. uh, in the different services as they go forward. Uh, so let me just briefly touch, I do mean briefly, on each of them. Uh, starting with the Air Force, I think when you look at the Air Force's big programs, the Air Force is pretty clear about its priorities. Its priorities are inherently already geared towards peer competition type uh, conflicts with the F-35, the B-21, the KC-46. These are the capabilities you want for a, a big peer competition. So I don't think we're going to see radical change uh, in the Air Force, but uh, the Air Force does have some problems to grapple with. It has, uh, it has a lot on its plate with even just the programs that I've mentioned already. It has a next tier of priorities uh, that with the budget influx, I think now it looks like it will be able to, to afford. Um, but how to shape those next year priorities, I'm thinking of the trainer and some kind of replacement for the JSTAR system uh, and some of the space capabilities to the extent that the Air Force still has responsibility for space. Um, how does it shape those to the strategy? And one of the dilemmas I think the Air Force has is inherently it is operating a, a lot of what it does in support of the other services. So I think it's going to be paced. Uh, by the decision making of the other services and, and by the decisions they make on what their next generation concept of operations are, to Kath's point earlier, uh, as to how it should be investing to support uh, whatever that concept of operation is. So the Air Force has its challenges, uh, I think, and also trying to align itself with the other services. Um, the, the opposite end of the spectrum is the Army, as Mark has already referenced. The Army has, has made clear that it's in the process of canceling a lot of its current uh, modernization programs or ending them and shifting in a new direction. And it's doing this so it can align behind the six priorities that, that the Army came up with in the last two years uh, as its answer to peer competition and how to get there. Uh, and so I think uh, I want to give the Army credit. Haven't seen the budget yet, obviously, but uh, we, we did a study a couple of years ago recommending that they really develop clear priorities and then very much align their modernization program around that. They're doing that. Uh, but I still think the Army has challenges as well. One, obviously, will be executing on a whole slew of new programs simultaneously. That takes a lot of uh, capacity that um, the Army is going to, I think, struggle to develop, uh, human capacity as well as organizational capacity. Uh, it's also a challenge for sticking, sticking with it. Uh, and over time, uh, you know, you can cancel a lot of programs, harvest a lot of money. But over time, the Army still has this, this larger dilemma of the competition between force structure, readiness, and modernization. And modernization historically has not done well in that competition within the Army. I think that's a longer term challenge for the Army uh, going forward um, in succeeding years. The Navy is, uh, as usual, kind of a middle case. Uh, the Navy has a lot, uh, you know, ship programs are not born overnight. Uh, they take a long time to get going, and the Navy has several advanced ship designs already underway, and so they're not going, I think, to make a radical turn away from carriers or from uh, Aegis destroyers or from a lot of the other ship classes that they've been uh, pursuing for years. Now, those designs, those large ships are inherently flexible enough to take on new missions without being radically redesigned. That's the beauty of, of these large capital ships. Uh, but the Navy does have space to align itself more strongly with the strategy in areas like uh, UAVs uh, with the MQ-25, the ways that could evolve. They have room when it comes to UUVs and surface unmanned vessels. And I think there's a lot that the Navy can do in that unmanned space that I'll be looking for. Uh, the Marine Corps, likewise, I don't think their big programs will luckily change much, but they also have been very active, especially in the small UAV space, where I think there's some interesting things happening. And lastly, touching on my old organization, Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, you know, the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering was created to drive change in the department's uh, modernization programs. I think they're poised to do that in a couple of areas where there's been a strong foundation laid. And I'm thinking of hypersonic systems uh, and, um, oh, what's the other, what's the second one? Hypersonic systems and asymmetric systems, the kind of things the SCO has been doing uh, across uh, a range of portfolios. Uh, there. I think it's, they're going to be challenged to make rapid progress on things like artificial intelligence and directed energy uh, because the foundation there has not been laid as strongly or as long uh, to uh, put them in a position to move quickly in that area. Thanks. Final. All right. Um, so, you know, we, we have been, you know, progressing into, you know, deeper and deeper levels of detail. So I'm going to go really deep now. Uh, and I'm going to focus on what we should expect for space uh, in this budget request. 
so much of the past year, uh, you know, we've heard a back and forth going on with the administration and the department and the National Space Council and Congress about whether or not to create a new military service for space, what the president has termed the Space Force. Uh, and so that we are supposed to see that proposal come out along with the budget request this year. Now, not that much of it, I think, will actually be contained in the budget. I think it will mainly be in the legislative proposal that comes with the budget request. Uh, but we're waiting to see a, a lot of that. And you know, if you go back to August, when Vice President Pence went over to the Pentagon and gave a speech, uh, he basically laid out their plan for what they were going to do starting right then. Uh, to start preparing and leading the way towards uh, eventually creating a space force. And if you go through that list, I went through it recently, um, they actually can't check a lot of things off the list yet. Uh, they've made some progress, but they haven't completed many things. So if you take, for example, they said they were going to uh, recreate United States Space Command. Um, it looks like they're getting closer to that, but they haven't done it yet. They haven't named a new commander for it. They haven't picked a location either. Uh, those are two things to look for. Now, they are expected to name that, that new commander soon, um, but you know, you got to have a, a person leading it, you got to have a location before you can uh, get started at all. So, you know, that's things to watch uh, you know, in terms of pro progress on those uh, issues they laid out. The big thing, though, the big uh, unresolved question is the scope of the Space Force. How are they going to scope this? Uh, is this just going to be Air Force Space Command elevated? Uh, or is it going to be more broad? And so, you know, first of all, we've got to find out, are they going to do this underneath the Department of the Air Force? So it'll be a, more like a Space Corps that Congress uh, had proposed back in 2017. Um, or will it actually be a separate but equal independent service, uh, as the President had said last spring? Uh, now, it's looking, you know, there apparently is a draft memo that leaked out. Uh, but I would caution everyone that anything that says draft may change. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to know until this is actually signed out by the president uh, and issued uh, where they come down on this issue. But it does seem like they're leaning more towards keeping it within the Department of the Air Force. So the next big question after that is, well, what are they going to do with the space related organizations and personnel that are in the other services and agencies? So what about the space uh, parts of the Army? What about the space parts of the Navy? Uh, they're not insignificant. Uh, there are thousands of people in those organizations uh, that do space-related work. What about the Missile Defense Agency and all the space-related work that they do? Is that going to get pulled into this? Uh, and then, of course, there's the intel side of things, the National Reconnaissance Office and other intel agencies. They do a significant amount of space-related work. Are they going to be left alone, or are they going to be pulled into this? Of course, um, I would bet that they don't pull in the intel side of this, because once you do that, now you're talking a whole other set of committees you got to go through in Congress uh, to get this approved. So, you, you know, you're going to double or triple uh, the amount of work uh, that you've got to do to get this thing passed. The next thing I'm going to be looking for in this proposal is what is their transition plan for the people? Uh, so you're going to be moving people around, even if it's just moving people from Air Force Space Command to be in this Space Force organization. What is the transition plan for the military personnel and for the civilian personnel? Uh, and there's a lot of questions that have to be answered. Answered. So if you just take the positions, a space position, and move that, what about the person in that position? What if that person was just assigned to that position, it's their first space-related job they ever had, uh, and they've only been in it for a few months? Uh, are you going to snap the line and say, well, you're in the job now, so now you're in the Space Force, so go get a new uniform? Um, and likewise, what are you going to do about someone who spent their whole career working in military space? They happen to be on a joint assignment somewhere in the Pentagon, uh, and you, know, you snap the line and they're not in it at that time. How, what do you do with them? Uh, how do you pick them up? And they may actually want to be part of this new organization. Uh, so that's going to be, I think that's actually one of the hardest parts of putting together a plan like this, is how do you transition the personnel, who goes and who doesn't. And then, of course, there's the issue of funding. Um, you know, we should expect that they're going to give us the administration's official cost position on how much will it cost to do this. Uh, of course, you can't come up uh, with an estimate for how much it's going to cost until you've done the job of you know, scoping it and figuring out who's going to transfer and who's not, uh, and how you're going to make this transition. Uh, so if they haven't done those first things I talked about, I don't know how they're going to do the, the cost estimate. Uh, but of course, that is one of the big things we'll all be expecting. Then the other wild card here with the space reorganization is the Space Development Agency, 
What are they going to do with that? Is this really going to be a separate, a, yet another space acquisition organization that is separate, that falls under R&E? Um, and is it going to stay there, um, separate from the Space Force, or is it going to transition into the Space Force? And if you're creating it at the same time you're creating the Space Force, why aren't you just putting it under the Space Force? Um, so I think that's a, a big unknown there, what they're going to do with the Space Development Agency, how that model is going to work. Um, now, the next thing I'll be looking for is not reorganization, but what are they doing with existing space programs in this budget request? Uh, and I'll give, you, I'll give you one particular program that I think may be the canary in the coal mine to let us know how serious they are uh, about space uh, and about actually in the Air Force getting serious about uh, funding these programs. And that program is the Next Generation Overhead Persistent Infrared uh, Satellite System, OPIR. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, what it is, is it's a follow-on, uh, the next generation of missile warning satellites. They st sit up in geostationary orbit, they stare down at the Earth, and they look for the bright plumes from missiles when they launch. Uh, General Hyten has said that this is uh, one of his top priorities, uh, is to get a more resilient uh, system up there, uh, more resilient against different forms of attack. Uh, and the Air Force has said, yes, we agree with you. We're going to get a more resilient system, and we're, gonna, we're not going to take 10 years to deliver it. We're going to deliver it, you know, first satellite within five years, okay, maybe seven. Um, and so they kicked off that program in the last budget request. Here's the problem, though. Uh, if you look at what they funded uh, for the next-gen OPIR program in the, in the PB-19 budget request, uh, it was significantly below what the program said they needed to execute on that timeline. In FY19 uh, alone, it was $400 million short. And so the Air Force's plan that they briefed to Congress was, we're gonna ask for a reprogramming request to cover the difference. And if you look over the next five years, which is what we're gonna see uh, in this budget request, in this fight up, from FY20 to FY24, um, last year's budget request was short $859 million over that five year period, relative to what the program office said that they needed to execute the program that they were, they were promising on the timeline they were promising. So what I'll be looking for, I think that's the canary in the coal mine, uh, does the Air Force actually fund this program over the FIDEP according to what their own program office said they needed uh, to meet that schedule? Uh, and then more generally looking at space acquisition funding uh, in the budget, um, space procurements in particular uh, have been in a, de in a decline for seven years. Uh, they peaked in FY12, uh, it's been cut by over half uh, since then. So when are we going to start to see the rebound in space procurements? Uh, a lot of that is because we didn't have new systems in development uh, in order to transition into procurement to fill the gap created by the programs that were exiting procurement. Uh, so when are we going to see that, you know, the space funding come out of that bathtub and actually have programs that are in procurement again? That's one of the big issues I'll be looking for in this request. And I would note before we go to Q&A, mm -hmm. we actually have a, a, a briefing, a, a policy brief that we're publishing in a few minutes. I think it's going to be going up on our website soon. Uh, that's what Seamus promised me before he came up here. Uh, so if you go check our website, uh, the four of us and Seamus have co-authored uh, a, a brief that basically goes into more detail on what we've discussed here today. Thank you, guys. That was incredibly detailed and thoughtful. Uh, let me pose a few questions to you individually in the group, and then we'll open it up to all of you as well. I want to start with you, Kath, not just because you're brilliant, but because of your work also on the National Defense Strategy Commission and its uh, outstanding report, and your point on the story. And I expect continuity with Acting Secretary Shanahan from Secretary Mattis' strategy. I, I wouldn't see where he would change anything. It seems Washington has uh, generally agreed that it was a thoughtful and, and smart strategy. But to, I think it was Andrew's point, and it sort of echoed everywhere, a lot of the guidance has been left to the services, and I think that the commission found that as well, that this uh, innovation or lethality or implementation of the NDS is in the eye of the service beholder, perhaps. I'm saying that a little bit wrong, and you want to correct me. But So if that's true, or if we think it's going to continue, um, is there a story that's consist that can be consistently told by the department, not just Mr. Shanahan, but by everyone, uh, when they're throughout the posture hearing season? And if not, will will they able, be able to sustain the ability to sort of move plans and programs forward to follow the national defense strategy or would just get more 
of the same, which is you know the last administration's investments and the one before that. Um, yeah, so I think that what we have seen, or what I can tell from the outside, um, for 18 and 19, the process went as you are, I am inferring from your statement, you believe also to be the case, which is the services were left to, largely left to develop the, uh, um, their POMs in a rough accordance with the DPGs, defense planning guidances, et cetera, that were put out, but you know, not a whole lot of um, uh, CAPE investment of time allowed to scrub those programs. I'll let Mark comment on that because he can, he can probably has better insight. Um, I, I don't know what the process was in 2020, and I think it will be very immediately apparent, is my answer to you, having lived in the department, inside the department for over 17 years. Um, it's very clear when a budget comes out which of these two pathways is chosen, you know, whether it's sort of each component. So again, even if it's not just the services, but you know, each, each of the components beyond that, defense agencies, et cetera, are developing their own program in rough alignment with something you know, that they can claim checks the box of what um, the evil overlords and OSD have told them to do, or whether there really is a coherent story to tell. Um, and so I can look back, I'm sure there's multiple examples, but I would point to sort of Bob Gates, the, the, you know, the 2012 budget where you could really see a story being told that was a collective viewpoint of where we were, what we needed to do in the present um, in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance, and then where, where the department's priorities should be in the future. Um, so my answer is if they don't do that, I leave open the possibility that they did do that. Um, I think we'll know it, and for sure what you'll end up having is way too much in there that can't actually get funded in the out years. Um, and, you know, a thousand flowers blooming, you may have some good things in there for sure. The services are competent, capable, capably led, and can come up with good ideas, but it won't, again, get to this issue of what are those inherently joint and often combined approaches that are gonna make the difference, build our asymmetries and close out our vulnerabilities, which are often in places like space and cyber that cross over component budgets um, that get us best positioned to deal with a China that is much more coherent. It's not 10,000 feet tall, has its problems, but certainly is more coherent. Let me, since she brought you up, Mark, I wanna cue the next one to Mark and Todd together. Uh, so beyond the story, let's get to the mechanics of budgeting. And if, if a $750 billion 050 top line comes out, but there's anywhere from five to 12 rumored billion for DHS, not just the wall, but it's gonna be funding for DHS. It seems like um, it's not just def defying the letter, but the spirit of, of the accounting system and the budget process and the committee jurisdiction. I mean, is this a total non-starter? What, what happens? If it's 750 with DHS money in the defense account, I, I find it hard to believe that it would get through the Congress, uh, mm -hmm. given the um, Congress's reluctance to fund uh, a wall or barriers in the um, southwest border, even through the regular processes as opposed to through the ID. I think it would only um, uh, have applicability if there were some, I mean, if the president did declare a national emergency and did mm -hmm. use some of the prior year money to build a wall, and then this money then would be backfilling right. for projects that had been canceled to fund you know, the barriers on the southwest uh, uh, border. Um, the president, well, I'm not gonna make any predictions of what the president will do because I've been consistently wrong. Uh, I, I, mean, I think if, there is, if part of the 750 is actually to be for the border wall or to backfill for border wall funding, um, then the bottom line is, you know, that is not money going to defense, right? So mm -hmm. we should disregard it uh, as money that's actually going for defense-related purposes. Um, so I, it's, you know, it'll be a budget gimmick, I think, mm -hmm. uh, if, they, if they try to do that. So Andrew and anyone else on the panel wants to talk about it. So we know that the Missile Defense Review was recently released and presumably, I think, will be one of the more traceable documents that we can say is included the shifts in funding, I hope, anyway, uh, in the 2020 budget request. So uh, there are new programs proposed in the Missile Defense Review, turning the Joint Strike Fighter into an ICBM killer, drones on lasers, space-based sensors and interceptors, hypersonic weapon countering, et cetera. 
So uh, do, you, do you think that ne since it came out not with PB20, but it came out recently, that the intent was to show progress in the 20 request uh, for these types of investments? How disruptive will it be in the 20 top line? And what does it push out if it is? Well, that's a great question. You know, I think one of the areas where uh, from, from some of the feedback that I've heard, there has been a lot of CAPE involvement mm -hmm. uh, has been with MDA's budget. Uh, now, not everything that you referenced in the Missile Defense Review is going to fall on MDA. A lot of it actually will fall uh, on the services. And of course, you talk F-35, that's probably going to be handled uh, through the program office. But you know, a, a lot of it will be within MDA. And so the, the idea that there's been this robust interaction between CAPE and the agency suggests that they have been, in fact, working very hard to figure out how much and how quickly uh, they can incorporate this into the budget. And I think that how quickly question to me is the one that really jumps off the page because this is rocket science uh, and quick is, is, it can be an equation, right? Everyone likes to talk about how we, you know, constructed the first ICBM in, you know, three years or less and, and we did, right? You can move fast when properly motivated, uh, when you have an organizational foundation to build on and, uh, and you're willing to invest a lot of resources into it. Now, having said that, as mir miraculous as it was to build the first ICBM, you know, that wasn't the hardest task in the world, it turns out, you know, to, to launch uh, something of that size. Uh, some of the things that you have to do to build, you know, a persistent space-based sensor layer are actually quite a few magnet orders of magnitude harder to do. Uh, and there's a lot more involved in launching a large number of assets to do that. So I think the speed with which they're going to do it will be really interesting for me to look at. Uh, because speed has been the mantra. Um, and uh, the problem is sometimes when you try to go fast, you can end up tripping and slowing yourself down. And so if the assumption is, you know, look, we can launch 100, uh, you know, 100 satellites in three years' time and have our layer as fast as we might want it, um, I would be a little skeptical of a plan like that, right, that that, that would truly be executable. So that, to me, the key indicator there, I do expect to see that plan in the budget will be how quickly are they planning to get it done uh, and how realistic is that plan? Todd, let me take the question but add Space Force in to the Missile Defense Review. So the 2020 top line request, assuming it's ultimately roughly in the 733 range, excluding any gimmicks for walls and stuff, uh, that's just an inflation adjusted budget. That wasn't an innovatively driven, you know, uh, unique yeah. approach. So we, we can kind of, they just, 19 enacted it and adjusted it for growth. So if you're talking about, like Under Secretary Root has add, said for the Missile Defense Review that there will be, you will be able to see new investments based on the review in 2020. Plus, as you mentioned very well, the, the Space Force in whatever form will be coming over. Uh, two things. That's essentially a fixed top line with not a lot of upward growth. So there has to be, there's disruptions underneath that top line, right? So what, who are the proverbial losers, even though I hate that term, or the trade-offs, if so, or what do we think? And, um, and secondly, for the Space Force, what, do you expect it to mostly fall burden-wise on the Air Force? And then what is the trade-off within the Air Force's own budget specifically? Yeah. I mean, so starting big picture, um, you know, this, this is like the, the dirty truth I think most people know and work in defense is with a $700 billion defense budget, you could fully implement the national defense strategy. You're going to have to make trade-offs. You're going to have to make some hard choices. You're going to have to make some people mad uh, to do it. With a $750 billion defense budget, you could completely fail to implement the strategy by investing in the wrong things. Uh, and just continuing to invest in old things. So, you know, whether or not they're implementing the strategy is not as much about a question of the top line. They can do it with a lower top line if they wanted to. To do it within, you know, the numbers, the range of numbers we're talking about, they are going to have to make some trade-offs. Um, you know, if it was less than 750 billion, there would be more trade-offs. But even at 750, they've got to make trade-offs. Um, you know, just to keep you know, as kind of level set everyone, if you just want to maintain the same size force you have today, you need about 3% growth above inflation in the budget every year. That's just a fact of life because of compensation cost growth, because of O&M cost growth, readiness, uh, and, you know, acquisitions, they don't get cheaper. Uh, when you buy the next generation of equipment, it costs even more than the prior generation. So you look at that over time, you need 3% real growth just to maintain the same size, same capabilities in the force. 
Um, and so they're not getting that, you know, um, with the, the budget projections that we're looking at here. So I, I think there are a lot of competing things. So I think the first thing that's going to have to go if they're serious about implementing the strategy uh, is there's not going to be any growth in force structure, um, you know, overall at least. Uh, maybe parts of the force will grow, but other parts are going to have to decline. Uh, and so this 355 ship Navy, it's out the window, I think, if you actually want to implement the strategy. Uh, of course, ship count's a bad way of doing it anyway. But, you know, and the Air Force's plans, 386 squadrons, like, that's not going to happen. Uh, not, you know, in this budget reality that we're in. And keep in mind, this is a pretty robust level of funding. Uh, that's just not going to happen if you actually want to implement the strategy because you're going to have to go cut par parts of your force structure that really aren't important to the strategy. Uh, and you, you're not going to reach 386 squadrons and however many planes that ends up being. Uh, of course, unless you subdivide your squadrons. That's a good way to cheat. Um, but I don't think they're actually <laughs> planning on doing that. Uh, so, yeah, so macro perspective, I think it's, it's force structure. Uh, it's where you're going to have to make some serious reductions. That's going to be hard. Uh, and then cutting off procurements and some legacy programs uh, that don't quite you know, meet the priorities of the strategy. Does one come to mind, for example? Well, you know, they're never going to do this, but carriers, uh, amphibs, um, I, you know, I don't see a good, you know, I don't see why those are priorities uh, under this strategy. You're not going up against China or Russia with aircraft carriers and then launching an amphibious assault uh, against their mainland. It's not going to happen. Um, so, you know, if those are really the priorities, you know, I can see there's a lot of areas where you could start to make some targeted reductions. That's going to be extremely painful, politically impossible. Um, but, you know, if they're serious about it, there's way to freeze, there are ways to free up money uh, to cover these other priorities. Uh, and, you know, and then within space, you know, if they're doing the space reorganization, uh, it's mainly just, you know, 90, you know, 5% or more of the funding is just transfers transferring it out of the Air Force's budget, out of the Army, out of the Navy, things they're already spending on space, just transferring it to the new organization. The overhead layer that you put on that, which you know, is going to be, that's going to be an interesting thing to see whether they think the overhead layer is going to be. Um, I've already published my thoughts on that. CNA <laughs> has published their, well, I don't know if they've released that yet, the CNA study on that. We actually come pretty close uh, in our cost estimates of what that's going to be. Uh, the Air Force is in a, a different order of magnitude in their cost estimate. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, what do they propose there? If it's a billion dollars or less per year, um, that's pretty easy to come up with that kind of money uh, within a $750 billion budget. Um, you know, you take a little bit here and there, various things. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, you might even be able to do that with efficiency savings, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to go there. <laughs> a billion a year, surely segue. we could do that. He's ready to jump in. Go ahead, But Mark. I wouldn't count on it. Um, but, but before we leave Missile Defense Review, I do have to plug that we have Mark Trachtenberg here tomorrow with Tom Carrico, who leads our Missile Defense Project, to speak on the Missile Defense Review. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, well, um, uh, a thought on the legacy, and then I'll go on to management efficiencies. Uh, on the legacies, I think the services probably will make some cuts, not the way uh, Todd has proposed, but for example, I think the Army will stop upgrades to the Bradleys because they're going to bring on a new um, uh, vehicle. The Air Force will probably uh, retire some of the older F-15s and F-16s, maybe the A-10s uh, make a run at that again. Um, and uh, uh, the Air F uh, Navy probably retire the older uh, F-18s, that sort of thing. Uh, now, the downside is that as the force gets smaller, it can do less day to day, and the department will have to um, ask it to do less. Now, it has, it has a proposal, a, a notion about how to do that, you know, dynamic force employment, um, you know, great idea, very difficult to do in the real world. Uh, management efficiencies, uh, is it possible to get management? Of course it is. Uh, the problem is that they're very painful, and you have to um, use political capital uh, to get them. When I talk to people about and efficiencies, I say, uh, the first one is BRAC, closing uh, unneeded bases. The department says it has about 22% uh, excess capacity. Uh, there's a proven process there with proven savings. And the uh, efficiencies get harder after that. And of course, the Congress has balked at uh, uh, allowing uh, base closures. You could, for example, go after uh, DOD schools and ask the question why DOD runs a school system. Uh, you could look at non-war fighting uh, medical research and ask why DOD is funding uh, autism research. Uh, you could look at some of the uh, uh, 
school system. You know, ask why the services have uh, prep schools when the academies get 12,000 applications a year. There are a lot of questions you could ask about efficiencies, but each one of those has uh, strong advocates, and, and many of these institutions are functioning well. It's not that they're bad. The question is whether DOD should be doing them. Can I just jump in on this? Mark made a, a really great point about the particular challenge the Army has of transitioning from older production lines to newer production lines. And so I said they need to do this, and maybe I made the sin of making it sound like that's kind of easy to do. So let me just touch on the flip side of it, which is you know, the industrial base review that DOD yes. finished last year said that the combat vehicle industrial base is, I'm going to put it in my own words, is, is weak and has significant shortfalls and gaps in it. And that's because of, you know, the, the you know, uh, Mr. Toad's wild ride that the, uh, the combat vehicle industrial base has been on over the last five years, which has been actually quite devastating. And so we've got real weaknesses in the industrial base for combat vehicles. So then the Army says, okay, we're going to stop doing upgrades to Bradley's because we're going to get that new vehicle. And when does production of that new vehicle start? Mm -hmm. It's not next year. Mm -hmm. It's probably not the year after that. So how can, you know, how can you, how do you make that transition without further exacerbating an already serious problem? Right. They have a similar challenge when it comes to future vertical lift. Uh, mm -hmm. Not as severe in any way as what you see with combat vehicles, I don't think. But it is a challenge of how do you go from today's production lines, which are producing good gear, to what we have are relatively mature prototypes um, that we could think about, yeah, that's something we maybe can get into production on in the next three or four years uh, if we commit ourselves to it. But how do you make that transition? The, in the short term, it's probably gonna cost more. Great point. I wanna open it up for questions in our remaining nine minutes. We'll get you out of here right on time. And since I haven't been able to come over here, we'll just start with you. Um, assuming, or I know that I'm kind of asking you to do some mind reading here, but since you mentioned that if there's more of a delay for the budget release that might lead to a CR, do you guys feel at all that the, the issues over the current short-term CR and the funding for DHS um, might not prompt lawmakers to really maybe make sure that they're on time for the next budget so as to avoid the situation that we're at now? Thanks. I, I, I think that um, I think that the political establishment feels burned by the shutdown and, and the negotiations that have happened over the last day or two are very encouraging that um, we may define barriers as being acceptable. Uh, uh, so I don't expect there I, th I expect there to be less likelihood of a shutdown in October, but a CR is very different. I mean the government keeps functioning it, we, they just kick the ball down. Uh, 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 downfield for making a final uh, budget agreement, and I think that becomes more likely. I mean, I, I would add that I think we're probably, regardless of the, the shutdown and when the budget comes out, it's probably the odds are 90% or higher that we start the FY20 on a CR because they can't pass appropriations for FY20 until they have a budget deal on the budget caps. And I don't think they're going to get serious about a deal on those budget caps until they get close to that deadline. Uh, and the deadline for the enforcement of the caps is not till January 15th of 2020. Um, so they've got almost a year uh, to, you know, wait. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I, don't, I don't think they'll start getting that serious on negotiating. I, I would love to be proven wrong on that. Uh, I would right. love for them to, I mean, I think um, Representative Yarmouth, who's the new chair of the House Budget Committee, he has said that they want to start, you know, thinking about this right now. Um, you know, that's great, but I, I don't have a lot of confidence that they're going to get a budget deal on the budget caps anytime soon. There is one wild card here I want to I want to highlight, which is the big push right now for um, sort of abolishing shutdowns, mm -hmm. right. uh, because you know historically the Appropriations Committee has been a little bit sanguine. They do not like entering the fiscal year without an appropriations bill passed. I'm not saying that they plan for that per se, but uh, they're a little bit sanguine about the fact that sooner or later the committee will have its way. You know, somewhere along the lines. They're going to they're going to pass a budget now. If you abolish shutdowns, if we establish mechanisms that automatically keep the government running in the absence of appropriations legislation, they no longer have that confidence. They're going to be a little more like uh, when I was on the authorization committee, where we started the very first thing we did when we thought about how to draft the NDAA is how do we make sure this gets signed and passed, 
you know, before the year starts, because if not, we may never get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very different dynamic. And I think it puts them on a different timeline in the appropriations process. If some of these ideas about you know, creating automatic mechanisms to avoid shutdowns were actually put in place. I would say there's one other wild card. I said I wouldn't do this. You I, should I do, this. do it <laughs> one time. There's one other, uh, as a moderator, I'm not a panelist, but there's one other wild card, and I think it's going to be this massive um, OCO to base transfer that Mick Mulvaney and OMB mm -hmm. acting White House Chief of Staff is pushing that I think will poison the well of negotiations before they even get underway. So, yeah. Hi, Steve Trumbull with Aviation Week. Um, I was just uh, curious if you could drill down on the nuclear uh, modernization plan in this debate between Adam Smith and the administration's position. Um, how likely do you think the current plan emerges from this process unscathed? And if not, what, what particular programs do you think are most vulnerable during the process? Well, let me start. And I know. You want to start? Uh, uh, let me, uh, I'll just say, I, I think, because the Obama administration had proposed a nuclear modernization program, I think that the, the programs that were begun then would be um, um, less vulnerable. I think the ones that the administration has added since then, low yield nuclear weapons, for example, um, uh, nuclear cruise missile would be uh, more vulnerable. And GBSD, even though that was in the Obama administration's proposal uh, or plan, you know, is, is always controversial. I mean, other than, you know, this sub-launched low-yield nuke, um, basically this nuclear modernization plan is the same as the Obama administration's plan. Uh, I know the Trump administration doesn't really like to hear that, but that's true. And the Obama, some people in the Obama administration might not like to hear that uh, as well. Um, but they're pretty darn similar. Uh, and so, you know, I think since the major elements of nuclear modernization made it through uh, a Democratic White House in the past, um, you know, I, I don't think that a Democratic House is going to be able to alter that trajectory that much, although I think these programs are going to come under much greater scrutiny, specifically the cruise missile LRSO and GBSD, the new ICBM. Yeah, and I'll just say, I think a lot of that ends up being cost avoidance as opposed to actual cost cuts, and I think that's the real challenge for Smith, which is to, if he wants to show some progress on cutting nuclear modernization on principle, if you will. I think that may end up causing just drag out on modernization, which is not ideal. That's a great point, Larry. <laughs> Lara Seligman with Foreign Policy. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about China. What do you think we have to see out of this budget to to kind of prove or show that the administration is really seri getting serious about countering China? Well, the, I, I'm going to answer, but it's not conquering China, just to be clear. I mean, I think that, I, I think, I think oh, good, thank God. I say, I'm glad it's my hearing. Uh, I apologize then. Um, there may countering be a China. Who knows? There may be a constituency for that, but no, um, I'm countering China. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think that, as I said, I think the key issue from my perspective is, you know, the rhetoric is all there on the NDS, and the administration deserves a lot of credit for pulling together very, coming at the right time, but also the right rhetoric at the right time, if you will, for very strong bipartisan consensus around the um, view that China is the pacing challenge set. Now, slight caveat, just to say, that's kind of been true since about the 97 QDR. It's just life gets in the way, and life tends to happen in the Middle East. Um, and we shouldn't be so, um, we should be humble enough to recognize that reality again, particularly if John Bolton wants to start a war with Iran. So what I'm looking for in the budget is, are you now t fleshing behind that concept that is long animated, I think a train of c common defense thought about the pacing challenge of China, a set of ideas about how to actually um, deal with those operational challenges that threaten our interests, particularly, not only, but particularly in the region in East Asia. So again, I'm looking for, many of this has been mentioned specifically by Andrew, but I'm looking for, is there a concept that marries in a joint way the, the manner in which we can overcome those A2, AD challenges? And I'm suspecting I would want to see a lot of that in, in cyber and in space um, investment in, um, you know, a way to manage through the missile exchange ratio, which there could be different solutions for that. 
Um, I'm looking for precision guided approaches. I'm looking for netted forces. And I'm probably looking for some form of a, um, a ground element, which could be uh, from the Army and or from the Marine Corps and inevitably from both, um, because that's how the way it, way it works. Um, so those are the types of things I'm looking for at the operational level. And then stepping back, I'm looking for the big cultural change of how do we operate as a department? Are we keeping our investments in S&T? Are we serious about moving things quickly through the acquisition cycle? Are we serious about partnering with industry and with international um, partners and allies? Um, and how do we show that? And I think the way you show that is you actually invest yourself institutionally to say we are an institution of change and innovation and that permeates the way we hire people and promote people, it permeates um, what we invest in, our schoolhouses, et cetera. So um, maybe that sounds like a tall order, but I don't think it's too tall for the challenge that they've very well laid out in the NDS. And I would agree with all of that and say I think there's also some important signaling that is likely to happen or could happen in the next couple of years. So I mentioned earlier there's a foundation within uh, some of the OSD programs, the SCO efforts that were started for doing some things where we could do a you know, a dramatic test in the Pacific of a hypersonic system, uh, could demonstrate something, could demonstrate a hypervelocity hyper projectile fired from an Army um, you know, artillery piece demonstrating a, a, a more favorable, you know, missile exchange defense type capability where if we were to do such a test, where would that happen? Well, maybe lo and behold, it'll happen in, in Japan or on Guam or some, right. some relatively prominent location like that. So I think there's a lot that they are postured to do because as Kath said, there's some things that are in, you know, have been in the works for a number of years that are probably at a point now uh, where some of the cover can be rolled back I think uh, I speak for everyone. I say thanks to the Fab Four for making this defense discussion interesting and funny. <laughs> I want to be fast. Thanks for the clock.